I was sludging through the swamp that is Reddit the other day when I stumbled upon a fascinating conversation, one that really got the gears in my head turning. It was all about the complex world of audiophiles and how their high standards and meticulous critiques can sometimes overshadow the enjoyment of many other enthusiasts. The debate on there was fiery, opinions were passionate, and I just couldn't help but feel that, you know, this conversation needs a fair and balanced mediator. So that's exactly what I'm stepping in as today. In this episode, we'll dive deep into the heart of the argument, dissecting viewpoints from both sides. We'll investigate the complaints, the praises, the fervent beliefs, all to uncover whether the grievances of one camp genuinely outweigh the opinions of the other. Let's get to it. Okay, so I think the best course of action here is to take excerpts from the original posts and posters and use them as talking points and then integrate some of the responses from the comments and use that to balance things out. For each talking point, I would love everyone's input as to how they feel about that particular topic in the comments below. I will also be providing my two cents on each of the talking points because some of these pertain to what I do. So I will definitely jump in there. Let's begin. The first OP posted a dissertation. Here is the first segment I found interesting. So let's say you want to buy some headphones. You check some YouTube videos and this guy is saying this headphones are the best audio experience he had. You check another video and another guy says the headphones are a piece of crap. And some other guy says they aren't bad, but you can use EQ to make them sound better. Why would you buy something that sounds bad enough to use EQ? Meanwhile, it seems people like to enjoy using expensive words that makes you have to learn from a audiophile glossary what they are talking about. And it's basically simple things like more or less bass, mids and treble, if you hear clearly the sound on the right or left. <laughs> Jesus, quite a bit to unpack there. So let's start from the top and then Break it down. Yes, you heard it right. The YouTube landscape has indeed left many of us feeling a tad, you know, divided due to polarizing views on the very same products. This phenomenon arises for several reasons, and typically most of us agree on the majority of the products we review. However, bias can subtly seep into reviews, often fueled by potential monetary rewards. This unfortunately can steer reviewers' opinions, aiming to keep their income stream flowing. Is this practice disingenuous and unethical? Absolutely yes. Does it occur more often than we realize, even with YouTubers we trust? I'm afraid it might. We need to acknowledge that it's part of the industry we're involved in, and many reviewers may have their hands dipped into the proverbial cookie jar. It's challenging to determine who might be swayed by hidden sponsorships because such transactions tend to be, you know, back alley type of deals. One way to gauge potential bias is by examining product reviews, say, you know, an amplifier or streamer. If you find a glowing review amidst a sea of critical ones, it might signal a reviewer influenced by external factors. Yet, remember, this isn't foolproof since personal subjectivity often drives our hobby and a lot of people just hear differently. I know, it's frustrating, but it happens. Now, regarding the assertion that some reviewers claim EQing can enhance a product's sound, I must concede. I agree again with this guy's opinion. We should ideally seek out products whose sonic characteristics naturally align with our personal preferences. Buying a pair of speakers and then having to tweak its sound characteristics for enjoyment might not be the most satisfying approach. Finally, concerning the audiophile glossary, it's undoubtedly beneficial to use vivid descriptive language. So I do disagree with this part. Labeling a speaker as having great bass or great mids or great highs doesn't really provide much insight given that numerous speakers share these attributes. When we describe a product, we aim to transport you into the experience, immersing your senses in the sound, helping you feel as if you're right there with us. That's why we try and use an expanded vocabulary to verbally illustrate the characteristics of the products we review. He continued to pour his heart out, expressing his overwhelming feeling towards this hobby. The clandestine nature of it all seemed to have shaken him to the core, prompting him to step away. It's genuinely disheartening because I believe with the right guidance and support, we could have nurtured his passion and kept him engaged. But sadly, we've lost a fellow enthusiast to the complexities of this hobby. One guy responded, best advice, good is good enough. Couldn't agree more. When you reach the point where things are good, potentially great, and 
There is no need to continue to pine over the new stuff when your stuff is absolutely good enough to enjoy the music. Another person said, there's a lot of placebo, advertising jargon, and bandwagoning in the audiophile world. So I see this playing out with many companies. You see, many are locked in a fierce battle fighting over the attention of a specific audience, which leads to their advertising strategies being remarkably aggressive at times. Okay, let's move on to the next one. This guy titled this thread, most people buying high-end audio products shouldn't buy them. Okay, he went on to say, a lot of people just find the bass boost option and turn it to the max. If you do this, be it in a car or any audio device, you're an idiot and you don't need a good sound system. Just buy a subwoofer and listen to everything on it. You're gonna get about the same stupidly saturated bass and the occasional medium and high notes trying to get through. Wow, you know, I used to love the bass boost option on my Sony Walkman in the late 80s and early 90s, so you pal <laughs> nothing quite like manufactured sound signatures so he's not he's not completely wrong let's see what else he had to say some people just don't need it let's be honest you don't need the whole home theater setup to watch the news nor do you need a 15 speaker bose system in your car to listen to the radio to be fair those products are sometimes sold as a very overkill package especially in cars but like unless you are really someone who enjoys watching movies regularly or you are a music enthusiast, you truly don't need more than your TV speakers or the most basic speaker settings you can get in your car. Getting more than that is like taking a performance package on a car when that car is by all means just a grocery getter. You don't need it, it's just been advertised to you as the most better option and therefore you need it. Well, he, you know, he does strike a chord with this argument here, delving into the psychology of consumer behavior, really. So companies are indeed notorious for relentlessly pushing the narrative of bigger and better. Their masterful manipulation techniques could be quite persuasive. With entire departments ingeniously crafting marketing strategies, they aim to convince us that their upgraded versions aren't merely products, but tickets to prestige and exclusivity. But the real power lies with us, the consumers. Understanding your personal needs, wants, and standing firm with your choices can truly make all the difference. He continues on, you may have bought overpriced shit, not much to add. It's not because it's expensive that it's good and a lot of people just don't really know what's good and get scammed by good marketing. If you're interested in buying a good product but don't really know what to buy, ask a friend who is knowledgeable or go to a specialized shop. Best Buy isn't specialized. All right, well, this one comes across a bit abrasive, but if we extract the essence of the message, it becomes clear that he does genuinely care about protecting consumers from exploitation, a truly admirable stance, really. Personally, I might have framed it a bit more tactfully, but ultimately his point rings true. Unfortunately, there are numerous companies that intentionally target the wrong consumers. This practice results in several drawbacks. It fails to cultivate repeat business as buyer's remorse sets in. Having invested in a product that didn't meet their needs or if it did, could have been achieved with a less expensive alternative. Furthermore, it fuels negative word of mouth chatter throughout the community, painting both the product and the company in an unfavorable light. It's a misguided strategy that does more harm than good. Someone responded here, uh, apply this strict logic to like 95% of things us Americans spend our money on. No kidding, he's not wrong. Someone else said, I feel the same way about keyboard and mouse enthusiasts. That one was funny. Nothing wrong with a sexy keyboard or mouse though. Let's do one last one since this is taking a bit longer than expected. I am enjoying this though, and it's interesting to see people's opinions from around the world. If you are enjoying this format as well, please comment below and uh, let me know. We might do this more often. This one was titled DAX preamps and other audio gear. I've been getting more and more interested in the audio gear world. I've had a pair of JBL Studio 590s for over five years now. I have paired them up with a vintage Marantz amplifier. I'm still trying to learn and understand the audiophile scene more. I'm curious, how important are DAX and preamps? At what point should you invest in said gear or other gear outside of the actual speaker and amps. Is it worth spending a hundred bucks on a DAC? Should you get a thousand dollar DAC? When should you or should you not invest in a DAC or preamp? 
and I'm really not trying to make a recommend me gear post, but let's say you were to spend 15,000 on a system, what percent would you spend on the speakers, amp, preamp, DAC, and room sound control? Would you even buy a preamp at all? Well, you know, this is a guy that could use an afternoon with some mic on audio videos <laughs> because I do answer every single question he had in past videos, but I will briefly address it here and provide my opinion on his arsenal of questions. So do you need a preamp? Well, depends. Do you need a preamp? It's one of those components that you either you know, have it integrated into your amplifier or it's not. So since he mentioned, you know, he had a Mer classic Marantz amplifier, I'm assuming it's an old receiver which has the preamp built in. The only reason he would need one is if he upgraded to an amplifier that didn't have any integrated features. Now, as far as the DAC, I personally have one that's priced slightly over $1,000 and I thoroughly enjoy it. However, you can discover some fantastic options starting at around, you know, the $100, $150 mark. Your choice ultimately hinges on your budget and the extent of your reliance on digital sources. Now, as far as the percentages go, I don't know, I would say 50% on speakers and 50% on everything else. It often doesn't work out that way and people will oftentimes divvy things up however they want, but I always like to invest you know, a huge chunk of it, you know, on the best possible speakers first, and then move on from there to everything else. It's not a race. So you have plenty of time to save up more money for a nice amplifier, sources, room acoustics, etc. This is not the type of hobby you want to finish in an afternoon, right? So one guy responds, uh, my take is 70% speakers, 20% preamp, 10% accessories. I do think danks, pre's, and amps all make a difference synergistically. I don't think the DAC is as important as the preamp. Important, yes. I guess you need something way more resolving than anything I own. I don't know, Jack, but I find, for me, better SQ from separates. I feel like power amps offer deeper performance than receivers of most ilk. Well, he's kind of right on. I mean, I do agree with most of that. Here, Here's another one. 90% on speakers. If you want to do room treatment, spend some of the speaker budget on that. For 1,000 or 2,000, you can have an excellent performing electronics. No need to spend more. It's all about speakers in the room. Well, he's absolutely right about it being heavily dependent on the speakers in the room. However, the 90% is a bit aggressive, you know. You have to leave some type of budget for, you know, power, sources, everything else. All right, folks, that's all she wrote. If you enjoyed this video, this is kind of weird and different for me, I suggest you, you know, fish the like button from out of the waters. It's attached to your rod, mother lecker. Easy now, fuzzy little man, Peach. Subscribe to the channel and ring the bell to get notified every time a new video is born. With all that said and done, folks, I will see you on the next one. Take care.